Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, today's video is about the pith ball and the force that quantum mechanics ignores. So we start with the pith ball. This is the sta standard explanation in this graphic I got from this link. And it shows the pith ball in a neutral state. And uh, then what happens when you approach it with a negatively charged rod. And there's induction. And then it tells you what happens uh, when you touch it. And then finally, uh, when and the pith ball is pushed away, repulsed. Their explanation basically is based on the fact that each, uh, that the pith ball and the rod have atoms, and the atoms have a positive charge and negative charge. They tend to have that kind of bipolar uh, balance here. And, and for a neutral, they're, they're close together and balanced. But when you bring a negatively charged rod next to the pith ball, the negative charge on the uh, rod pushes the negative to the left. This shows it completely over there, but it's mostly just the negative is sort of biased to the left, leaving the positive to the right. Since this looks more positive here and this is negative, they claim positive and minus attract, and so the pith ball is going to come and hit the rod, and when, when it hits it, then there's a transfer. Here's a, this is a, a force that shows uh, the electrons transferring to the pith ball, adding more uh, negative electrons to here, making the pith ball negative. And since the rod is negative, you now have repulsion. And what you have in this case is our, our, our forces. This is a force here uh, that's pushing the pith ball towards the rod. That's one of the forces that quantum mechanics doesn't talk about. Uh, this is conduction. That's not the same kind of uh, a force. But here again, repulsion is the repulsion between the negatively uh, charged pith ball and negative charged rod. And that's a force that somehow causes them to separate. And that's a force that quantum mechanics ignores. Well, you know, I've talked about this many times. Is is charge real? And 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 so, but let me first comment about that standard explanation. That explanation is good if you accept the idea that electrons have a negative charge and protons have a positive charge. And in the TPM model, I find no physical property that explains charge. Why electrons are negative? and why protons are positive. No physical property that describes that. And the force line that goes from plus to minus has no physical description. Uh, things are moving, but this is just a line, and, and, and nothing is said about what might be there moving and uh, doing that. What's even more confusing is the force line direction. It's always shown from plus to minus. But look what happens if you pass, through, assume these are, this is like a plate, a positive plate and a negative plate, and I'm going to pass a proton, positive charge, right through between these two plates. And yes, as you would expect, if you accept the idea of charge, you find that the the positive proton is going to be uh, repelled by the plus side and attracted by the negative side, and so it should move in this direction, which is in the direction of the force. That seems to work okay. But if you take an electron that is negatively charged and pass it through, the negative electron is going to be repelled by the negative plate and attracted by the positive plate, and the electron goes the opposite way which makes it seem like the force line is in the wrong direction. Uh, that's, all I'm saying is that's confusing. No physical property. There is no physical identity of what this force is. And uh, you got to keep the direction straight somehow. 
So, so charge to me isn't real. But in a video that they show, this is a, that they, you can get a, a lot of different videos like this. I'm going to show you attraction caused by charge. This is an interesting point in this video because the uh, the the plastic rod has been rubbed with fur. It's negatively charged, and what the uh, person does is he brings this uh, rod just where the pith ball is over here, just below it, and and slowly adjusts it closer, such that he gets it to get very very close, but not touching him. And this is where you have this attraction, this this induction going on. The pith ball is attracted. It's it's not charged. This is this is an interesting point here. He hasn't touched it. It's a neutral pith ball that gets attracted. And they say that's by induction because the uh, negative electrons push the negatives away, leaving positive on the near side edge. That's their explanation of attraction. And then there's repulsion. This is the same video a bit time later. He's let the ball hit the rod. It's gained a negative charge, and the pith ball is being repelled. It as soon as it touches, it immediately jumps off, and he struggles around to get this to uh, stabilize. It never, you know, it, this is moving. That's moving pretty easily. So, but it does stay at a certain distance, indicating there's kind of a balance. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a balance between the rod, the pith ball, and gravity pushing down on the pith ball. Keeps the same distance, presumably, as the, dis the rod discharges and the pith ball discharges, this distance would be shorter. But that's repulsion, negative, repuls repelling negative, no explanation about what's happening here to cause that out there. Well, and this is to repeat the fact that this is an electrostatic force and it's ignored by quantum mechanics. Uh, again, plus and minus, plus repels plus, minus repels minus, plus and minus attract, and you have these forces. And there is an equation for that force. If this is a proton here and an electron here, this is the electrostatic force between a proton and an electron. And it tells you the magnitude, the value of that force. This is an empirical equation. Uh, Coulomb did a lot of testing, a lot of work, uh, developed this equation. Uh, it was developed after Newton developed his, and, and you kind of thinking out loud, well, wow, maybe he had Newton's equation in mind when he worked on this particular one, because they look very similar. Quantum mechanics has four different forces, and this one's not included. Well, They've been trying to unify the forces, and the one that is not cooperating, is, in a sense, is gravity. It, in terms of history, electricity and magnetism was unified in the 19th century, and unification of electromagnetism with we, the weak force followed suit, bringing into play what they call the electroweak, which is electromagnetism and weak force together. Well, those are, are, are two of the forces. Uh, magnetic uh, is, is right there as well. I've been told that this is the author writing this from the Stack Exchange. I've been told that unifying these with the strong force is likely to be far easier than unifying them with gravity. In other words, they can work this out pretty well, but unifying with gravity is difficult. And here's his reason. Apparently, this is because of the fact that electromagnetic, weak nuclear, and weak nuclear force equations are relatively similar, whereas the equations for gravity differ greatly. The math is different, and getting them, one, to work with gravity, uh, the particle physics to work with gravity, or gravity to work with particle physics, hasn't worked. 
So I'm, I'm going to address this uh, again a little bit differently. Uh, I'm asking of the four forces, all those forces they mentioned, they don't mention Coulomb's force. But here again, you have Newton's for, uh, equation for large objects, and you have Einstein's equation. What's, what's difficult here is uh, this gravitational equation is in terms of force. Electrostatic is in terms of force. Einstein's equation is not in terms of force. Not an expert on his equation, but as I understand it, it relates the, uh, uh, the geometry of space, space-time, with the uh, distribution of mass in the universe, and that's what it does. But there's no force. Uh, makes it, to me, more, much more difficult. But if you remember when you first saw this, if you've ever studied science and, and saw this, most people see this and say, wow, it looks just like gravity. And in my mind, the fact that they've left it out, that this is one, is it, this is not one of the forces in the quantum mechanics and hence is a big mistake because here you do have similarity of equations between large objects and small particles. A big mistake. If they would just get rid of their idea of charge and look at this as uh, the kind, type of gravitational equation, it looks like they might make some progress. So let's go to the particle model and, and talk about how the pith ball now works. I got three different situations, one with a, a, a rod that's neutral and a pith ball that's neutral. And as you've heard me say many times, there's a G1 particle field and a G2 particle field surrounding each object, creating a gravitational field, in this case, an F, uh, emphasized G2 gravity around the rod and G2 gravity around the pith ball. They're both neutral. They've both been discharged to ground. The pith ball's discharged. You're discharged, the desk is discharged, everything's got to be neutral, and when you bring the rod up to this one, it doesn't seem to move much, although there is a force there that could cause it to move. They usually bring it up close and you don't see much movement, uh, but from my point of view, it is a possibility that you get close enough and, and that this will actually move and hit due to the G2 forces. Well, now this is a plastic rod and you rub it with fur and you pick up, normally they say you pick up electrons from the fur and it, it, uh, it charges this rod negatively. Well, in the particle model, you pick up G1s. Now you have extra G1 particles here. What happens is this force the length of the line, I mean, mean that this G2 force is stronger. The reason it's stronger is because the G2 particles lose more as they go through when there's more G1 particles. G2 particles hit and scatter, leaving fewer here, causing a stronger force on the pith ball that way, similar force this way. So now you have a, a much stronger force and G2 gravity causes the attraction. Well, the last one is a glass rod. And when you rub silk on a glass rod, you lose electrons or you lose G1s. And these holes are supposed to represent the place where the electrons, uh, the G1 particles were now missing. Well, now, you, now the G2 particles can go much more easily through, more easily than up here because there's, we've taken away from the, from the rod, the glass rod, the natural G1s that were there. So you have, a, you have less loss, which means you have less force. And, and one of the things you find is that you rarely see a video where they charge a glass rod and, and show how it attracts a pith ball. I looked and looked so I could show one, but I, I, in my search, I couldn't find one. Well, I did find this statement from this link, uh, 
physics Libra text. It, it says, now let's do exactly the same experiment with a glass rod that has been rubbed with silk, which is what I just described. We bring the charged glass rod close to an uncharged ball. It initially attracts, but weakly. Now, they never explain why it's weak. But in the previous slide, I showed you that the G2 force would be weaker and therefore it would be harder for you to attract that pith ball. Okay, the particle model repulsion actually has two steps. Here we have a plastic rod with excess, extra loosely held G1s. By the way, I did mention that earlier, but these uh, G1s are orbitals around uh, various atoms in the plastic rod. They're loosely held, and we know they're loosely held because over time they will, uh, they will uh, escape and, and be gone, uh, either because they hit each other or because the G1 particles that are flying around back and forth all over here will occasionally hit a G1 particle that's loosely held and knock it out, and these things become discharged. Well, this diagram shows that the plastic rod is charged and the pith ball has touched, just touched the rod, such that there is conduction. This is the point of view that's conduction. I can see that, whoops, my, my figure is not, is not so good there. It's overlapping the, uh, the text. What happens here, what I, and what I wrote here is that the G2 force is very strong because this pith ball, pith ball is really close. It's much stronger. And these loosely held G1 particles can get pushed this direction. So I'm saying that the, the reason that conduction even works is because G2 uh, gravity pushes them this way and, and they go into the pith ball. I showed them straight, but uh, often they would go around the metallic surface of the pith ball. That's the first step. Now repulsion itself could start with a mechanical bounce. Remember this pith ball is coming. It's moving faster and faster. It hits it. It could compress and then bounce. So it could start with a mechanical bounce, followed by streams of G1s that are now moving and pushing the pith ball away. But that, uh, that's, uh, whether that could last very long that way, I don't know. But finally, repulsion can only come from a magnetic field. Particle model doesn't have charge. So the possibility exists that when this flow starts, that the G2 force around this object will create a magnetic field such that uh, you've got uh, one big, huge magnet, just like a magnet and a uh, uh, paper clip. Paper clip doesn't repel, but because of the bouncing, this one separates and the magnetic fields, you have both attraction, your G2 force is still there, and you have repulsion, and it's a matter of which one wins out. Whether the pushing force of the magnetic pushes it away is strong enough to overcome this, and apparently that's so. Well, this is a little bit of a different way to talk about it and bring it down into uh, the reality of what we see uh, commonly uh, or feel. When pushing two magnets together, north to north or south to south, you can feel the force resisting your efforts. There has to be something there. It, it, it just isn't a plus and minus with a, an arrow. There has to be something there. And I'm, we're saying in the particle model that the magnetic field is G1 particles orbiting around and through the magnet. And when you put these things at that position, you get more collisions of G1 particles than you get attraction, and then you end up with repulsion. You, f you can feel it. So you, it really t gets you the sense that there's something there. And that's what the particle model says. The G1 particle is there orbiting around and through. It's a very high intensity string of G1 particles. You know, we can also feel the effects of gravity. 
sitting here, I can feel it. Uh, if I stand too long, my feet start to hurt. You can feel the effects of gravity. We're being, I'm being compressed here. There, you know, that doesn't happen just by writing an equation or drawing arrows. That happens because there's a physical thing doing it. And of course, that's G1 gravity. Electrostatic forces, we can feel that. You put in a charged rod next to your head, you often get your hair standing on end, and you can not be, besides standing on end, you can kind of feel it there. There's something there that you feel. And, and again, that's the, actually the G2 particles being con controlled by, uh, G1 particles being controlled by G2 gravity. If we can feel these forces, this means that there should be some real object that makes it happen. The standard model doesn't give us that, doesn't tell us that, does not have a physical object that makes up each force. But in the particle model, we are unified. You know, uh, for a hundred years, quantum mechanics has tried to take gravity and unified it. They got string theory, they got quantum loop gravity, and they're all trying to make that work, and it hasn't worked yet. In the particle model, this is an empirical equation for the force of gravity, Newtonian type gravity. This is an empirical equation for the force between two particles. A, a, a nucleon and a G1 particle, N1 and G1 particle are attracted, and that's the force that keeps the hydrogen. This could be the equation for the force that keeps the hydrogen atom with one nucleon, one G1 orbiting around it. That's the force equation. They're the same. The, the math is not different. I do have a a uh, equation for the G1 gravity that I've used that involves the G1 particles and the forces and, and everything that is involved with that. Uh, and, I, and I've shown that, uh, that equation. I can tell you now, although I haven't developed it, that an equation for the electrostatic force using the, the uh, TPM model would, again, the, mo the equations would be very identical, very similar, not identical. And by the way, if there were a G3 gravity, the equations would be the same. We're unified in that respect. Here's my conclusion. General relativity and quantum mechanics has not been unified even after 100 years. And, but they ignore the one force that I think could help. TPM is unified. The concept of gravity is at all levels. The, there are similar interactions of G2 particles at level two, similar to the interaction of G1 particles at level three. It, it, it's the same thing. They either pass all the way through or they hit and scatter or they get trapped. And that's true of level one and that's true of level two. And finally, the math is the same. TPM is already unified. My name is Bob DeHilster, and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.